Miriam, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Okay. Let me let me read again a uh, very brief file uh, for those who uh, tuned in late. <clears throat> so Miriam, Miriam Dame is a visual artist and systems thinker. Uh, what I was saying earlier, uh, she has invented an algorithmic system called decision fields uh, that is new to me. Uh, so I'm just reading some of her sentences. It creates infinitely variable patterns on a plane. I'm very curious to see that uh, more details. Her art has been exhibited at museums and galleries in the United States and abroad. And she has been awarded residencies in uh, several cities in the United States and in, uh, in Paris. Okay, the floor is yours. I will uh, kill my uh, video to give you maximum bandwidth. Great, um, hello. Okay, you can share your screen. Um, I will share my screen in just a second. Um, so thank you so much, Piero, for having me. Um, I love this context, uh, and I hope that that turns out to be clear why I would um, love the context. Um, so I call my work decision fields. I've also called it embodied algorithms. I've come to think decision fields is a little more accurate. Um, it's, it, it does have to do with emergent patterns. And to be honest, it's this whole thing, this whole decision fields thing has, it, it arrived with me and it, where it came from is part of what I'm gonna talk about, but where it belongs, I'm not really sure. And it, it kind of bedevils me. Um, and the way I've dealt with that is I've turned the not knowing of what it is or where it belongs. I basically turned it into a game, which I'll talk about in the second part of my presentation, but some uncertainty runs all the way through uh, this, this conversation. Uh, the first thing I'd like to ask you to do, um, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. Um, I'm, I'd like you to visualize uh, yourself on a sidewalk. And it can be any sidewalk really, but ideally it's a kind of older sidewalk and you're just noticing things about the sidewalk. For example, you're noticing that it has three squares across for a little while, and then it shifts suddenly to two squares across. And it has a curb on your left hand side and the curb isn't divided the way the, the sidewalk is divided. It's divided only maybe every 10 feet. And as you're scrutinizing the sidewalk, all sorts of details pop out at you. It's not a uniform gray. It's got, um, there's like one square that's a lighter gray and smoother as though someone replaced part of um, the sidewalk. And you go a little farther and you notice that there's three or four squares in a row with significant numbers of cracks in it. And the curb isn't cracked, although it's missing a chunk. And perhaps you make up the story that a truck backed over this part of the sidewalk. And you go a little farther and there's an interruption in the sidewalk. There's a kind of oblong shape set into it. And you know, your, your mind knows that it's a, it's a utility box of some kind. And you're also, because you're paying attention, you notice, oh, it's weird that utility box actually interrupts the line of the sidewalk. And you go just a little bit farther and the material changes. Suddenly there's a trapezoid of yellow plastic with little dots on it and some, some lines on either side and you've reached the curb. Okay, thank you. So what was that? Um, what I think of that as is, is a decision field. It's a shared space of decisions, whether conscious by humans repairing the sidewalk or unconscious by a human backing up a truck or semi, a different kind of consciousness of a tree pushing up the sidewalk or shifting it. And it's, it's a way of both making decisions or showing decisions and they get recorded across time and space. And um, I'm just gonna leave that there for now and share my screen again. Um, so my project starts uh, with me starting a business back in, 2012. Um, I'm a visual artist and only lately have I realized actually I'm more of a systems artist and it's only lately because uh, as far as I know that's not a normal thing to fill out on say a grant application or in an art program. There's, there's, there are many artists who use systems but it's just not that common and so I didn't really understand I was using systems 
uh, my last project, which was to do with garbage, it was a giant sprawling system, but I didn't call it that. Um, and I went straight from garbage to this new project, which was block printing textiles. I started a small business um, in 2012 and I started it, um, sorry, I'm trying to fix my screen so I can see what I'm doing. I started it um, for a variety of reasons, but shoot, I'm sorry, you can see I'm not that adept at this. Um, uh, I, I started it for a variety of reasons, but mostly at the time, like I made up the reasons, but some of the main reasons, so it was a block printing business, um, Actually, hang on, I have lost my notes because of the way this works. So if you will just bear with me for a second, I need to adjust my screen so I can see what I'm doing. Okay. Okay. Um, so I started a block printing business because I, I wanted, there was something that I was looking for, but what I wanted, so block printing is a way of applying pattern to cloth. Um, and it's a modular way of applying pattern to cloth. It's not the kind of thing that you would do in the current world if you wanted to make lots of money. It's a very, very slow way of putting pattern on cloth. Although perhaps originally um, when the people who invented it, um, invented it, it was faster than weaving pattern into cloth and faster than embroidering pattern onto cloth. But now if you wanted to speedily even do wide variations, you could digitally print. And if you felt like being crafty, you could screen print. But I was really interested in block printing because it's, um, it's modular and because it involves the full body. Um, my original, my original uh, prints, were with these strange shapes. There it is. This is, I call the Martian. And with some words, uh, which were in the previous slide, which I can't, I can't figure out how to use this. Um, okay. Um, but those, the words, neither the words nor the strange shapes really got me that far. What I discovered was these little tiny stripey blocks that I'd had made um, were more adaptable. And a, a stripe is something that technically is, it runs along, it, par it parallels the cloth. It runs along the selvage all the way from the beginning of the cloth to the end, or it runs side to side. And that's because of the way things are woven with an upright and an across. With block printing, I'm applying the pattern on top of the warp and the weft, and I can put the blocks wherever I want. And it was a kind of delightful revelation when I realized that my stripes could go in multiple directions. And that is because the stripe isn't actually the full length of the cloth, it's, it's a segment. And all of my stripes were made up of these units with multiple lines on them. This one has quite a few, this one has fewer and I don't know if you can see but they all have a different width and they all have a different gutter between them and this was useful for me because it meant that if I flipped the block I could see what it looks like on the cloth I could see that I had actually flipped it and you might say well why is this useful well it's useful for a couple of reasons one is it gives more variation out of fewer tools so if I really wanted something mirrored as in these vertical things I could just flip my block over and run a parallel line next to it. But it also turned out that um, one of the things that I was interested in was seeing if my assistant, Hannah Levy, who was in that two slides ago, what she could do with the, the gift of variation. So I would set up experiments, basically algorithms in the shop uh, to see whether she could or what, what she would do with an open-ended set of instructions. So here we've taken the vertical and the horizontal and uh, run amok with it. There's endless numbers of verticals and horizontals. And you might notice on the, so the, the one, the, the image on the left is the single block with which that image on the right was printed. And that's maybe 10 feet wide by 11 feet tall. It's in two panels. 
So you'll notice at the top of that double panel, the number of vertical lines, there aren't that many of them and they're in irregular spacing. And the number of vertical lines at the very bottom, there are a lot more. And the density within the kind of weave structure of this that comes from rotating the block this way and that, all of those things were decisions made by Hannah uh, within the bounds of the rules that I set her. Um, and what happened, so what happened, I had this production studio, I was, I have a business, I'm trying to make fabric to sell to people, I'm trying to make a website and meet customers and do all those things. But meanwhile, in my workshop, there's this kind of weird feedback loop that starts happening. I realized that I'm not actually interested in telling my assistant to print a fixed number of patterns in a fixed number of ways. No, I'm handing her an algorithm in using different kinds of communication. I'm doing it verbally, in which case things get really messed up in what I get back. There's some kind of note taking, there's um, references to things we've done before or other pieces, or Hannah's actually handing off a set of instructions to somebody else. And pretty soon there's like complex communications going back and forth. And the results that come out of that, the byproduct of those feedback loops continually surprise me. Like, I don't expect that. Where did that come from? And why is it like that? Or there'll be an accidental occurrence of double patterns on a cloth because we've run one after the other. And that becomes a kind of a new piece of feedback in the loop. And so all of this is, um, it's kind of pressing on my brain. What am I doing? I'm trying to have this business making this really uh, slow process specialty fabric in Berkeley. But meanwhile, my brain is like pattern, 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 pattern. And what kind of patterns are there? And why are my patterns doing this when blah, 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 blah. And so I, it's getting harder and harder for me to sell things to interior designers because I don't have a fixed repeat. Um, they can't just order any old thing. They would have to enter into my little algorithm universe really to get what I'm doing. And so there's a kind of list of patterns that I think about. There's the decorative patterns, their growth patterns, things like trees and um, animal fur. Um, there's patterns, there are algorithms, which I'm clearly using algorithms, but it's not all that I'm doing. There are patterns that emerge from data um, and can be shown in diagrams like in Ian's wonderful talk. And, I, and I'm experiencing data in my prints because the marvelous thing about block printing with dye on cloth is every time a person presses the stamp into the cloth, there's a slightly different weight and mark. So it, there's a kind of recording of behavior and decision on the cloth. Um, so there's just a, a little, Solowit is famous in the 60s and 70s for creating algorithms and handing them off to a team of, of people to produce the actual drawing. And I was doing that to some extent, although with amplification because my assistants had um, a lot of latitude in how they could work, including pushing back on me and my instructions and saying no. Um, and so I, I needed to fold a different kind of pattern making tool in my list of patterns and it becomes about decisions and agents. And once I landed on that set of terminologies, my, my thinking around this shifted, although I still can't quite explain that well, what it is, why, why that's important. Um, this is a piece where Hannah had some degree of latitude and the, but, but you can see from what, what's there is the latitude has to do with stripes all running in a single direction. So there's, there's no breaking off of that plane. Uh, she got to choose color, she got to choose where a stripe might change within within a stripe or where there might be a gap or whether one stripe overlaid another stripe, but it was fairly limited. And, and, and that's because this was for a customer. But if it's not for a customer, then, then how do I decide what I'm doing? And for the time being, because I, so the, the piece on the left, um, and I realized I just stopped my sentence, but the piece on the left has, has a kind of intent to be a useful piece of fabric for someone who might wanna upholster a chair with lines going this way on one part of the chair and that way in the other part of the chair. It's a fairly straightforward thing from my workshop of basket weave. 
The piece on the left has some straightforward basket weave on the bottom, and then it starts to fall apart and become something else. There's an intrusion or an addition of another pattern. So these decisions, these are decisions so far mostly made by me. Um, I can imagine, and I have, that you know I could put something like this. I could design a piece of software where you could have a slider, as I've added, you know, an illustration of a slider at the top. How much basket weave? More basket weave? Less basket weave? Does that solve what's in this picture? Does it answer all the decisions? No. So we could add some some dials. Um, we have a dial to change the scale, perhaps of the whole pattern or of the unit within the pattern, or the angle at which the pattern comes across the cloth. There's a dial to change color. There's a dial to change an individual unit. So in the regular basket weave, the horizontal stripe has five lines and the vertical, sorry, yeah, the horizontal stripe has five lines and the vertical stripe has three, but I could use my unit modifier to change that. Um, I could use my extender to make the lines run even farther or change. And then I have a pattern add button. And then there's really what happens when a human being is standing in front of the cloth, holding the algorithm or multiple algorithms in mind and being responsible for the choices of taking a basket weave and then this time making every alternation between vertical and horizontal different. How do you make those choices? And can my sliders and my software answer that? I'm not so sure. And then the other thing that happens with this is that as an individual person makes a choice about extending a line, um, uh, you can see that each, each set, it segments a little bit like bamboo and each pressure will allow you to have some kind of understanding or track the thought of the person making that decision. Um, so all of that happens within a really, it's, it's in a kind of contained system. We can take all these marks and have them be arbitrarily assembled and you get a different kind of reading. There's information here, but it's not necessarily trackable. It's more chaotic, it's looser. And so I'm interested in this space of, um, uh, um, I'm interested in this space of what happens with the decision. So this is a video of, if it's gonna, ever gonna load, um, it's a video of the decisions that went into that. I'm gonna, oh, here it goes. Um, so because this is so fast, it's time-lapse. It's, it's doing something that we could imagine happening, which is the pattern starts accruing, it builds up and it shifts from one side of the fabric to another. So what it's not doing is it's not informing you about the, the person who's making those decisions, who's continuing a stripe or adding a color or making a shift of every decision um, along the way. And what's fun for me, and I didn't really emphasize in this beginning, um, I got a little nervous, is that because the lines are built up of segments, each line is actually multiple decisions and it's just a really strange it's a really strange idea and it's become um what this process is about so for me what's happening is that um uh, i'm just going to stop the share for a second so i have the system for making patterns and it's not really about making patterns it's about giving a person or as I've come to realize an agent an opportunity for making a pattern or not. And from what I saw in the workshop working with Hannah and for a brief period of time, a, a second assistant, the interactions among the people translate to interactions of the patterns. And because I don't, I, I, have, I have an intuition that this is some kind of a tool. It would be useful for somebody else. At the moment, what it seems to do is like allow me to make painterly textiles. But I, I'm, 
I keep wanting it to fit somewhere else or for other people to use it or to understand my thinking behind how it makes a difference, the opportunity to make a pattern and then let that pattern dissolve or to make a pattern and then to meet another pattern along the way. And so because I don't know where this belongs, what I've done is I've made a game out of it. Um, it's called Decision Fields and it's starting to have a rule book. This is a draft. And the way the game works is there's a shared field and the field may continue in any direction and players. So this is imagining overlooking a field, looking down from above. And player one is maybe starting a basket weave over there on the left and they have four moves. And player two is starting this kind of simple stripe pattern. And maybe they roll dice to see how many moves each of them get. And maybe they just peaceably work side by side as though they live in Chattahoolik and they're not competing with each other. They're just playing the game of putting patterns together down on a piece of paper or a cloth. And then at a certain point, the patterns meet each other. And so here are two individuals and they're making decisions about how to make the pattern and whether the pattern is regular. And they're making decisions about um, their attention is coming and going. And so maybe they make things that are officially mistakes for their actual pattern. But in this process, because there's nothing, um, there are no stakes here, no bridge is gonna fall down if one of the struts is wrong. So if, if something gets reversed or misaligned, that's just a mark of inattention and that's fine, our attention wanders. So meanwhile, the patterns have met each other and that fosters this whole new zone of what do we do when our patterns meet? How do we respond? And it could be anything really. Um, do we work together? Do we work around each other? Do we overlap each other? So I've run this as a game a little bit and I'm starting to do it more and um, it looks like this, people, you know, multiple people on the same plane. And what happens is um, the patterns build and build and build until there's no space left. And that fosters even more decisions. Part of the game um, comes with these cards that might be a prompt if your pattern meets another pattern and whether or not you respond to the pattern, uh, whether or not you respond to the prompt is, is um, the way I have the game currently it's up to you because I'm interested in, in autonomy and choice. So you might dry, draw the card overrun when your pattern meets another pattern and you may choose not to overrun um, or overrun very delicately or overrun with the permission of the next pattern. Um, the, uh, the prompts, the behavior prompts may end up actually within uh, the game itself. Um, so again, the, so there's a game and there's a pattern system, which is only partly about patterns and is mostly about decisions. And then there's me and my brain wondering where this might belong and who might want to play with it and how I can introduce other people to it and allow them in so that it um, might be fun for them. Um, yeah, so I think of it as a tool possibly and tools I've thought of as like a visual calculus. Is that possible? Um, it's a little different than circles and lines, which I know can be used uh, mathematically. I don't know. Um, it's fun for me to think about and research, and it would be fun for me to figure out who to talk to and who would like to play this with me, um, or whether there's a lab where I can play with robots and see how they do with decisions where there's, there's nothing really at stake and the patterns are open-ended. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. You mentioned robots at the end. Of course, uh, when I was uh, listening to you talking about patterns and games, I was thinking, well, what about using some AI, some uh, some machine to play with? Yeah, I would, uh, I, I would love that. I mean, I don't personally have an AI, so I would <laughs> have, to, have to find one, yeah. Because, because what I'm asking is, is not, it's, you know, it's orthogonal to regular decisions. So what yeah. am I asking the AI that it would want to choose? How would it know what to choose? Okay. Uh, you have a question in the QA, but first I wanted to ask you, uh, at the very beginning, you mentioned that there are, you said that there are artists, they use systems, but they don't call themselves 
um, they don't call themselves uh, system artists. Uh, can you name some artists that I would know that uh, you would consider a system um, artist? So, I mean, the, that's a great question. So there's Mark Lombardi, who uh, died several years ago, who made these beautiful, beautiful, intricate, very clear flow charts about, say, dirty money moving around the world, you know, who was implicated. So he's a system artist. Um, there are artists who, I mean, I'm, Sarah Z is a systems artist, I would say. She works with giant systems that are unfurled and unpacked. Um, mm -hmm. What's the last name? Z, it's S-Z-E. Uh, okay. There, okay. There are a lot of them, okay. Okay, uh, you want to take the, the question, scroll down at the QA. Okay. Um, does the speaker have any interest in sharing this game in community context? Yes, I would love to, that would be fantastic. Um, it's playable outside as you know, in California, as long as it's not raining um, during COVID Great. outside masks, totally. Yeah. yeah, that would be fun. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, this, this is fascinating.